In this part, I would like to talk about the effects of an export subsidy. For example, frequently it is said that the Chinese government is subsidizing its export industry so that the Chinese companies have an advantage in the international world markets. So one example for an export subsidy is the case of China. The idea is that the exporting nation implements an export subsidy. The exporting nation pays a subsidy for the quantity of goods exported and this should increase the competitiveness of the domestic firm in the international goods market. Once more, we would like to examine this policy tool by comparing the situation with free international trade. And then afterwards, we are implementing this export subsidy. And then we want to find out what about consumer surplus? What about producer surplus? What about government revenues or government expenses? And what about the net effects for the whole economy? In slide number 21, you can see the situation where free trade prevails. Uh, the international price is larger than the price in our Taki, so we are talking about an exporting nation. The quantity of 60 is demanded. The quantity of 85 is supplied, so production within China is larger than the demand within China. And the difference between production and de uh, quantity demanded is exported. So here 25 goods are exported. What about consumer surplus in this scenario? It is the area above the price line below the demand relationship. So the green area symbolizes consumer surplus. The yellow area symbolizes producer surplus. Now we want to examine what happens if the Chinese government is implementing an export subsidy. So when China is implementing an export subsidy, the revenues for the Chinese producers are equal to the international price plus the subsidy. So here we assume that the Chinese government is supporting the domestic industry by paying $10. So the revenues for the Chinese producers are equal to the international price of 100 plus the uh, 10 units in subsidies. This leads to a situation where the Chinese producers will increase production so the quantity supplied will increase from 85 to 95, production is up. The quantity demanded within China will be down from 60 to 50, so that now the quantity exported is up from 25 to 45, the difference between production and consumption. What are the effects for consumer surplus and producer surplus? Of course, consumer surplus is down because of the fact that now the price is higher and producer surplus is up. The yellow area increases. Once more, we plug in some letters here and these letters symbolize different areas. The area V, D and W, they represent government spending. We said that in the scenario with an export subsidy, 45 units, the quantity of 45 units is exported and the subsidy per unit is equal to 10. 
So the blue area here symbolizes the export subsidy the Chinese government is paying to the domestic producers. So the area V, D and W represent government spending. So the net benefit of an export subsidy is equal to the producer are gaining the area U, V and D, while the consumers are losing the areas U and V. The government is spending the blue area V, D and W. So now when you uh, compute the net benefit of an export subsidy, is once more equal to two triangles. So the Chinese government is losing, or the Chinese economy is losing the triangles V and W. These are the net effects of an export subsidy. Net effects of an export subsidy are negative. Until now, we only examined the case of a small country, but I think that this is sufficient because the effects of a large country um, supporting its industry with an export subsidy is also clear cut. The country which is implementing an export subsidy will lose from implementing this measure. So the welfare effects in a large country are also clear cut. The large country is losing from subsidizing its export industry. And therefore, we don't have to examine this case explicitly. Why is China performing this kind of policy? Maybe um, they are only implementing this kind of policy for a short time period, like they want to give um, their export industry a head start and they are only um, subsidizing their export industry for a shorter time period. This argument is called like the infant industry argument. In the beginning, the government is protecting its export sector and uh, is trying to push the export sector by subsidizing it, but these subsidies are abolished at a later point in time. Nevertheless, we had a look at this uh, um, introduction of an export subsidy in the small country case, and there the effects are clear cut. The exporting nation will lose from subsidizing its export industry. In the end, I would like to talk a little bit about the difference between a free trade area and a customs union. So I would like to talk about preferential trading agreements. A free trade area, FTA, is characterized by a situation where the products can be shipped freely within the free trade area, but each country has an individual tariff policy against third countries. In a custom union, it is the case that we also have free trade among the countries within the customs union, but we also have a joint tariff policy against third countries. What is the difference between a free trade area and a custom union? Some politicians say the difference between a free trade area and a customs union is, in brief, that the first is politically straightforward, but an administrative headache, while the second is just the opposite. In a customs union, it is a case that goods ha have to pay tariffs when they cross the border from the Union, but from then on can be shipped freely between countries. The duty must be the same for all countries, otherwise the importers would choose the point of entry that minimizes their fees. 
This is highlighted on slide number 27. Like, for example, here you can see in the upper part the EU and the UK. In case that the EU has implemented a tariff against products from New Zealand and the tariff rate is 10%, while the UK has uh, a tariff rate equal to 2%, of course, it would be the case that the New Zealand producers would try to enter this area via the UK because there the tax burden is lower. So this is the idea behind this sentence here. The duty has to be the same. Otherwise, the importers would choose the point of entry which minimizes their fees. The drawback of a customs union is, of course, that countries have to transfer part of the, their sovereignty to a supranational entity. For example, the different countries of the EU have to uh, transfer uh, some of their power to Brussels, to the EU. They are not able to decide the tariff rate against third countries. This decision is made in Brussels. In a free trade area, it is very important to distinguish whether the good was produced within the EU or the UK. How can it be prevented that cheap butter is coming from New Zealand, shipped via the UK and then put on a truck to the EU, for example, to Ireland? Custom inspections have to be in place so that only UK goods pass the border and not goods which are just trans transshipped via the UK to the EU, which stem from third countries. So, in case that there is like a free trade area between the EU and the UK, it is the case that we need to have border controls here between the UK and the EU in order to find out is the good produced within the UK or is a good produced in a third country, for example, New Zealand. So we need border controls between the UK and the EU. But what is, for example, a New Zealand pack of butter. If the butter comes from New Zealand as a 50 kilo block, but is finally processed in the UK, does this qualify to be a, per, a British product? What if New Zealand exports milk, but butter is produced in the UK? Is the butter a British product? In case that there is a free trade area, which is not a customs union, we still have to have border controls in place and we have to specify complex rule of origins rules, which determine whether a good is a British good or whether this is not the case. Whether this good is illegally to cross the border between the UK and the EU without pay, paying the tariff or whether this is not the case. Let's have a look at this kind of map. You can see here Scotland, England, Wales, no problem at all. But we have one problem is here. Yeah, here it is a case that we have a problem between Ireland and Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland belongs to the UK. Ireland does not belong to the UK. Ireland belongs to the EU. So in case that the EU and the UK wants to trade on the basis of a free trade area and not a customs union, 
it seems to be the case that we need border controls bet between Northern Ireland and Ireland. And this is something we don't want to see in Europe, that this kind of border will be re-established because of the conflict between uh, these two countries, the civil war, which uh, occurred in the 1970s and 1980s between these two countries. We don't want to see this kind of border again. And therefore, there is so much noise, so many discussions about the border between Ireland and Northern Ireland. The big question is, are we, um, will the EU and the UK, will they implement a customs union or a free trade area? When there is a free trade area, it is necessary to have some kind of controls between Northern Ireland and Ireland.